Hey fearsome friends. First off, I'd like to take the time to say a big thank you to all my listeners. I know I don't put out as many videos these days, but you've kept with me and I love you for it. Tonight I have ten, quite frankly, disturbing stalker stories for you. I've never been stalked, and I don't ever want to be, and my heart goes out to anyone who has. So sit back, relax, and get cosy, comfy, warm, because it's time to let your nightmares in. To set the scene, I'm from a small town in North Wales, UK, and I lived with my mum at the time on a large council estate, which is notorious for being a rough area. To get to my cul-de-sac, I would need to veer off the side of a main road onto a hidden hill that is shrouded by woodland. The road leads up to a golf course, but I would take the left path beforehand to get to my house. So in total, once I'd left town and was on this lonely trek, the distance was about 300 metres uphill and across. Now those of you familiar with the North Wales nightlife will know that it is slim pickings, and after trying my best to enjoy the only club in the area, I realised I'd had enough and wanted to go home. My friends were having a great time. It was 2am and they wanted to stay until closing time at 3, so I said my goodbyes and assured them I would get a taxi home. As I left the club I walked out into the chilly November air and thought to myself, it only takes 15 minutes to walk and I could be waiting all night for a taxi. I'll just walk. So little me in my wedged heels and eerily tight bandage dress thought I could take on anyone after a few pints of Dutch courage. As I walked past the 24-hour shop, it was full of leery drunk men who whistled and tried to get my attention, but I walked on by. This kind of thing doesn't scare me. Plus there were a few women around and that put me at ease. The further I walked, the quieter it got. I passed the final pub on the high street and I was greeted by an empty stretch of road scattered with terraced houses. This was the rough area, but I knew some people here so I wasn't too concerned as I strutted up towards the hill. But by now my feet were hurting after a night of shameless dancing. I was tired and couldn't even be tempted by the prospect of a greasy doner kebab. I'd finally reached the starting point of the hill, and during the day it was frequented by raucous young people or users, but at night all you could hear was the sound of the trees swaying in the wind. I thought to myself, how dangerous could this be? I walk here every day. And I continued the walk in anxious trepidation, knowing now I just had to get home. I envisioned unlocking the door and falling into bed, waking up and joking with my friends, and this encouraged me to brace myself and endure the cold and gloom. I reached a point where I was completely shrouded by woodland, and the only way to go was up. It was dark, there were no street lamps or people nearby, and by now I was closer to home than if I'd turned back. Just then in the silence, I noticed a white circle in the middle of the road and although nervous, I continued on my journey. As I got closer, however, I realised this white circle was the silhouette of a large bald man in what appeared to be a black trench coat who bore a strong resemblance to Uncle Fester from the Adams family. What struck me as overly odd, though, was his reaction to me, or should I say lack thereof. He had clearly seen me in my bright party clothes, but just continued to stand completely still, apparently not fazed by my arrival. Something in my gut told me to just keep walking home, and once I'd passed him, all I have to do is turn left and walk down a dark path for approximately 40 metres before I'm in the safety of my super rough estate. So that's what I decided to do. Ten metres away from him, there was still no movement. Five metres. He didn't acknowledge me. Two metres away. He continued to stand staunch, staring at the mass of woodland surrounding him, unflinching, and as I walked past him I was shaking violently. What would he do? Nothing. He stayed completely still, static. So I continued my ascent until I reached the left turn and let out a sigh of relief that he wasn't behind me. Phew, I thought to myself. I think I'll get a taxi next time. But when I was about 20 metres into that last 40 metre stretch, 
I looked behind me and saw that he was slowly moving towards me. After all the stillness, something had made him decide to move again, and he started to speed up, and Uncle Fester was fast. I quickened my pace and finally my house was in view, but I didn't want him knowing where I lived. My logical thinking kicked in, so I decided instead of turning towards my house that I would hide behind a large cluster of trees and let him walk on. So I nestled myself in between shrubs and large coniferous trees and waited patiently, and soon enough he was walking just a couple of meters past my hiding place. At this point he had the choice to go down the stairs and to the cul-de-sac where I lived, or continue straight onwards onto the main estate. However, as he reached this point, instead of confidently heading for wherever his location was, which I assumed would be in the main estate, he stood still, seemingly dumbstruck. He was lolling his head, looking for me, and I just knew he was coming to find me. I really needed to pee at that point, so I did so in the bushes, and the sound of it made him look around. I contracted my pelvic floor so tightly it felt like an internal workout, as I desperately tried to stop the noise of my urine. Through the trees I could see how leathery his white skin looked as he let out a frustrated groan before pacing quietly for a few minutes. Then after what felt like a lifetime, but also no longer than ten minutes, he turned around and retreated back to the woods. I'm not sure what he'd had planned that night, but as I watched him through the bushes, I waited for a precautionary ten minutes to ensure I could safely get home. I then sprinted down the concrete staircase and onto my cul-de-sac, grabbed my key from my clutch bag and hastily unlocked the door. I was home. I conducted perimeter checks every ten minutes from my bedroom window to make sure he wasn't nearby, and I got to sleep at about 6am. This happened when the Night Stalker show about Richard Ramirez was really big on Netflix, so it was fresh in our minds. Earlier that day, I was in my room with my dogs and roommate, when we thought we'd heard the front door open. We didn't think much of it. That is until my roommate left the room we were in a few minutes later, and started screaming. I heard the dog that had followed her out going nuts too, and upon finding them, the front door was wide open. Somebody had seen her and fled. They'd been in our house, presumably heard us in the room chatting, and my roommate, along with my dog, scared them off. We were really startled, but we figured that it was over, locked the door and that was that. However, later that night, as we were watching the last episode of the Night Stalker show, we heard the doorknob jiggle. It was around 2am, so we paused and looked at the door, a bit shaken up and confused though when it had registered what was happening, my roommate started to yell for them to go away and that the police were coming. My dumb self isn't too fond of calling the police, so I hesitated, but then they started using something against the door to break it down. I grabbed my roommate, the dogs, and my partner who was with us, and we all rushed into another room to put more doors between us whilst we waited for the police. I also had to stop my partner from going out with a sword, because we didn't know what this person might have or be trying to do. But luckily, he couldn't break the door down before the police had arrived, and so he fled. They eventually caught him and he fought them, so he's in jail for a lot longer than he would have been. He admitted to police he'd heard women when he came into the wrong house earlier, but not a man, so he came back to find a friend. They never found the weapon he'd used on our door, and he won't say what it was, but it messed it up pretty badly. I've been having a super lousy few months, and this is kind of just the crappy cherry on the top. I was walking back from work yesterday to meet my spouse at our apartment, and being this time of year it's getting darker earlier again, so it was close to being fully dark when I was walking through. 
I'm always on edge when I walk alone. So I had my key lanyard in my hand ready, when I noticed right away that a guy came out from a side street and crossed the road to walk on my side. I was already at a brisk pace and was just a block and a half from home, but as I passed under a street light, he called out to me. I ignored him of course, but he called again. So I ignored him a second time and he shouted, What's your problem? Without turning around or slowing, I just shouted, not interested, over my shoulder and started walking even faster. Don't be such a bitch, he shouted and sounded angry, which is the point where I thought to hell with this and I broke out into a sprint down the street towards my building. He shouted after me again and after a second I heard his feet pounding on the sidewalk. I made it to the front door of my building, yanked the door open, slammed it shut and jammed my key into the locked lobby entrance. Now the front lobby walls are made of glass, so you can see clearly inside. I figured the locked door would deter him, but he sped walked through the lobby into the stairs anyway, and a few male neighbours I'm acquainted and friendly with were sitting in the lobby chatting, and I waved when they said hi to me. I guess I was lucky they were there, because the locked door did not deter him at all. Suddenly I heard a massive shattering smash, and nearly soiled my heart out. My neighbours then began yelling, and I whipped around to see that this asshole had either kicked or punched the locked door, shattered most of it, and was now trying to reach through and let himself in. I shouted to the neighbours that he'd been following me here, and I didn't know him, and then I booked it up the stairs and ran all the way to my apartment. I could still hear shouting when I got into my place, and told my spouse right away what had happened, so we called 911. The cops came to our building and one spoke briefly to me and my spouse, then a search was conducted for the guy, who had apparently run away when he'd seen the several angry yelling neighbours approaching him. We got a follow-up visit a couple of hours later from a different cop, and it turned out that the guy cut himself on the door, so it was easy to grab him once they'd found him. Apparently this wasn't his first time hanging around my complex either, and he's known to the cops here as an addict who follows people around asking for money. He has been suspected of buying from dealers in our complex, but was never caught. I guess I shouldn't even be surprised though, as it's not a good place, not a good building. It's just something we can afford until we can move on to better things. But I'm so tired of living this way. Last year I was going out for drinks with my friends, but since I had to go to uni the next day, I only stayed out until around midnight. My boyfriend promised to pick me up and take me home as I don't like to take the subway alone at night, but since I was pretty drunk by then, I took a little too long walking out to the pub, so unfortunately we had to wait for the night bus, with multiple stops, as the subway closes on weekday nights. Now for context, my boyfriend and I don't live together but very close to each other, around 15 to 20 minute walking distance, and both areas are pretty rough. He lives near a train station that has many crackheads, homeless and sketchy people around, and I live in a cheap, bad district with a high crime rate. My building has two entrances on two different streets because it is a corner building site, leading to a patio, and then to the apartment building and its doors, where to get into my apartment I have to open three doors. I usually use the entrance that is nearer to the subway and on the side of my apartment. So back to the night in question. We had to take two buses to get home. One drove us to the train station and the next to my apartment. After getting out the first bus we realised that we would have to wait around 20 minutes or so for the second one to come, and since I really had to sleep at home, I didn't want to stay at his place. My boyfriend didn't want to wait, so he persuaded me to walk instead of taking the bus, which sober me would never have done. But since I was still drunk, I didn't care how we got home, so I agreed. We started on our way and passed a few sketchy people, mostly people selling drugs, etc., but nothing too bad, when I saw a guy walking in our direction. I somehow got a bad feeling, so I told my boyfriend that I wanted to change to the other side of the street, because I didn't want to walk past him. 
when suddenly the guy yelled, Hey! as if he wanted to ask us something, but we ignored it and continued to walk. He got louder and louder until he started to yell, and I could see from the corner of my eye that he was coming over, so I whispered, run, to my boyfriend, took his hand and ran the fastest I could while the guy chased us. We ran and ran and ran, and then made a turn onto the street where I live, and we hid. It seemed like he was gone, so I took my keys out as we began running towards my building. We took the other entrance that I don't normally use, and as I was trying to open the door, my boyfriend started panicking, throwing me inside the patio and closing the door aggressively behind us. He pushed me in further, explaining that the guy was running from the other side of the street. He'd obviously taken a shortcut, probably thinking we were going to run to the subway or bus stop. If we'd had taken the other entrance, he would have clearly been faster than us. Being in shock, we unfortunately didn't call the police, which I regret, and I stopped going out at night for half a year. I slept at my boyfriend's place for two weeks, because I was scared that the guy would come back. And the worst thing about this? That he really wanted to get us for some reason. I still want to know why he chased us for so long. Two weeks after that, a girl a few streets away was raped in front of her building by a guy who chased her home and I wonder if it was the same guy, or just a coincidence. A couple of years before the pandemic started, a friend of mine, Mary, introduced me to a guy. He wasn't really my type, but she's one of those people who turns into a matchmaker when she's in a relationship. So I agreed to go on a couple of dates with him, so she wouldn't feel as worried that I might die alone. The first time I met up with this guy, it was a group date with Mary, her boyfriend Tim, and another friend and her boyfriend. This guy Mary was trying to set me up with, Joe, seemed alright. We talked, traded jokes, that sort of thing, and I was comfortable with him because I wasn't interested in him at all. At the end of the night, he asked if we could meet up again sometime, and I agreed. Afterwards, I told Mary, and she was delighted. Her boyfriend Tim wasn't very happy about it, though. Tim was training to become a doctor, so he's a very smart guy. My friends and I greatly value his opinion. There's something off about Joe, Tim announced, and I agreed. Tim and I talked it over for a bit, but neither of us had seen or felt anything worse than a bit of weirdness. Be careful with him, Tim concluded. Then I hugged my friends goodnight at the train station and left. Joe and I texted for a couple of weeks before we met up again, and those exchanges only cemented my first impressions. I just wasn't into him, and something about him was off. He began to reveal a side of himself that was less friendly as well. He had very low self-esteem, and was always looking for reassurance, which at first wasn't so bad, but it turned toxic pretty quickly, and he seemed to get off on that sort of attention. I didn't really want to go out with him again, but Mary was really invested in the idea of Joe and I getting together. Now Mary is a sweetheart, but she doesn't really have any instincts, which occasionally gets me or someone else in our friend group in trouble. Mary's cute and everyone wants to make her happy. She has good intentions, but because she has no instincts, she can't sense danger, and sometimes drags people into dangerous situations unwittingly. I was hoping this was not going to be one of those episodes. Anyway, Mary was excited about the next date, and Joe kept asking when I was going to meet him again, so I invited him to an event my hobby club was holding, as I figured that was safe, as we'd be surrounded by people I knew well. The evening was okay. Joe wasn't as creepy in person as he had been over text messages lately. And afterwards, we walked along the river for a bit, on a walkway crowded with families and tourists. We eventually parted ways at a busy train station, and I figured I'd just gently push this thing further into the realm of platonic, and everything would be alright. However, on one night a couple of weeks later, Joe called me and told me he was going to commit suicide. I freaked out and tried to calm him down by staying up all night talking to him, 
from when he called around 10 p.m. until the sun rose. Every time he calmed down, I tried to say goodbye, but he kept saying that if I hung up, he would kill himself, so I stayed on the line talking him down over and over again. Something about the situation felt wrong, but what else was I going to do? I wouldn't leave anyone to commit suicide. So as I sat on my patio watching the sunrise over the forest behind my house, he finally let me off the hook and said, thank you. Then for a moment I felt that I'd done the right thing. Maybe I'd just saved a life. But then Joe said with a voice full of glee, that was the best night of my life. Then he hung up. I was stunned. Had this psycho really kept me up all night, knowing full well the next day was going to be busy for me, just to get off on the attention? I decided then that there was no way in hell I was ever going to see this guy again, and I told Mary what had happened. She was very apologetic and finally agreed that Joe was a complete psycho, said she was sorry she had set me up with him, and told me to call the cops if he came to my house. I didn't think he would though, as he didn't have my address, and neither did the person Mary had met him through. I don't give out my address to anyone but trustworthy family members, because I don't want my abusive ex-step-parent to find me. That precaution probably saved me from a much worse experience. As it was when I broke it off with Joe, he took it pretty badly. He threatened to kill himself again. So I messaged Mary, and she contacted her and Joe's mutual friend, who kept an eye on him for a few days. Then not long after that, I started getting creepy phone calls after midnight. They were often at 2 or 3 a.m. where the caller wouldn't say anything, just breathed heavily. It was so unnerving, and I blocked the number every time. Joe must have gone through four or five numbers before he switched his phone to a private one to get around caller ID, and I couldn't block him anymore. I didn't know what to do. For more than a year and a half after Joe got a private number, I was forced to answer every one of his calls. A whole branch of my family have private numbers because one of them was scammed a while back and luckily the police caught the scammer and they didn't end up losing any money. But unfortunately for me, that meant that if I'd received a call from a private number at night, I had to pick it up, just in case something had happened to a member of my family. One particular night, my phone went off at 3am and it was a private number. I knew it was probably Joe as I was staring at my phone, trying to work out what to do. I never let the calls go to voicemail, because apart from the whole family issue, even if he didn't know where I lived, he certainly knew where Mary and Tim's house was, and I was afraid that if I didn't play along he might go after my friends. The phone was still ringing and I reached out to swipe up and answer the call, but then I paused. I had an idea. Back when I was in high school, my dad would sometimes call early in the morning. If no one else was in the house, I'd be woken up, stumble over to the phone half asleep and answer it with a slightly croaky voice. Now I have a low voice for a woman, so every time I answered the phone like that, my dad would mistake me for my brother John. I realised that I could use that. So I cleared my throat, dropped my voice as low as I could and said, Hello? I was delighted with the result. I sounded exactly like John, it was uncanny. It made me a little sad actually as John had died about a year before I'd met Joe, so it was a bit of a jolt hearing something so close to his voice again, after almost three years. I quickly grabbed my phone before it rang out, tapped the answer button, then said that deep hello again, and this time there was no creepy heavy breathing, only silence. When I said another deep hello, and after a moment's pause, Joe hung up on me. I was overjoyed. Every other time I'd had to hang up on him, and no matter what I'd said before, he had always wanted as much of my time as he could get, so I let myself feel a flicker of hope. Maybe I was free. It's been over a year now and it looks like I'm free of Joe as I haven't got any creepy calls since I pulled out my John impersonation, and I can only guess that Joe thinks I've changed my number or given it to someone else. Joe never met John, so when I said hello he probably just heard a young man's voice. If John were still here, I'd know he'd approve. If I could tell him now, he'd be very happy to know a part of him could still protect me, even so many years after he was gone. I will probably spend my life looking over my shoulder 
Every time someone attacks the bins on my street, I worry it might be Joe. And every time my beat-up car passes me as I walk to the bus stop or the train station, I also worry it might be him. I've heard from mutual friends that Joe has said some awful things about me, and he's told some people he slept with me, which he didn't, of course. Who would sleep with someone that creepy? Worse than that, Joe and Mary's mutual friend has said that Joe told her he wants to kill me. Mary and I were horrified by that, so the friend has since told him I've moved to another city, so that might be enough. She's very close to him, distantly related actually, so he believes what she tells him, and when I'm done with my studies I'm going to move across the country. But until then I'm keeping my head down. My campus and Joe's are a 30 minute train ride apart, but that's nowhere near far enough away. But it'll have to do for now. There is one positive thing that has come out of this, though. Mary is now completely cured of any desire to play matchmaker. One time I was walking home from the train station after I'd spent the weekend at my aunt's house, and it was about 11pm at night and very dark outside. When I was almost home, I noticed a guy on crutches in front of me, who was walking in the same direction, then stopped every couple of metres to turn around and look at me before continuing. Since he was walking with a limp, I quickly passed him, but when I did, he stopped again and grinned at me very creepily. I carried on, and as I lived in an apartment over a burger restaurant, for a moment I considered asking one of the employees to walk me to my front door, because to get to it, you had to walk around the house into a dark courtyard. I decided in the end, however, not to ask. As I thought, what could possibly happen? The guy is on crutches. And I didn't want to come across childish. So I was walking through the courtyard and wanted to pull out my keys as I walked, but I couldn't find them in my handbag. And that's when I remembered I'd thrown them somewhere in my travel bag. I didn't want to lose them from my handbag whilst staying at my aunt's house as we were out and about so much. So still standing in the middle of the courtyard, I had to search my whole travel bag for the damn key. And being so distracted by this, I totally forgot about the creepy guy I had encountered before. When I'd finally found it, I looked up and the guy was standing right in front of me, grinning. I always thought that in a situation like that I'd start screaming. But instead, I couldn't get myself to make a sound at all. With my keys in hand, I ran to the front door, opened it and jumped in, the guy still following me, limping as he went. Luckily, due to his injury, he wasn't as fast as me. But on the other hand, our front door was one of those that slowly closes on its own to avoid slamming, so pushing it doesn't work. So there I was, trying to push the door into the lock whilst this creepy guy was following me into my house when thankfully the door fell into the lock just as he reached the doorstep. Through the glass door we just looked at each other, both breathing heavily from the race, and he looked quite disappointed. I quickly ran upstairs to my apartment and locked myself in. Then later that night I looked outside my window to see that same man walking up and down the road in front of the house. He'd hung around for about three to four hours after the incident, and I can't tell you what it was that made me not call the cops. I guess I just thought that as nothing had happened, there wasn't really much they could do. But after that, I didn't feel safe in my home anymore, because he now knew where I lived. I only left my apartment when being picked up or dropped off, and made sure to be home before it was dark. And I did this every day for two weeks. Finally, I decided to go to the police and tell them what had happened, and asked whether they could keep an eye on the neighbourhood. But when I got there, it was exactly what I feared would happen. They took notes and said, mm, We can't really do anything about it now. You should have called before. But we'll make a note. A couple of days passed when suddenly I got a call back from another police officer who asked me a load of questions about what had happened. He then went on to tell me that they'd been looking for the guy on crutches for months already because he'd molested several girls in town followed them into their apartments and even slept in front of their doors. He had been in police custody before, got
got out and violated probation, and had some kind of mental illness as well. The police officer told me to immediately call if the guy showed up again, but luckily he never did. It was only then that I understood the seriousness of the situation, and realised that I most likely had escaped an attempted assault by just an inch. In a way, I really didn't believe that the whole thing had actually happened, until the police called me back. This was five years ago now, but I still think about it from time to time, and it still gives me the creeps. I've quibbled with the thought of publicly sharing my story for a while now, but recently I've arrived at a place where I think the benefit of sharing outweighs the risk, so I'm taking a chance and just putting it out there. Maybe it'll help someone. Many times I've looked back on the odd events leading up to the scariest night of my life, which was October 5th, 2015, and I'd like to say that I did everything right, but honestly, in hindsight, I should have done more. I'm convinced that my son, who was three and a half years old at the time, actually saved me from harm that night. I could have easily become another statistic in the crime database, and although my stalker did not hurt me physically, it took me months to get past the psychological damage. In May 2012, I temporarily exited the workforce following the birth of my son Chris. He was born with a physical birth defect that would require multiple corrective surgeries during his first year of life. He was also born two and a half months early, which had complicated things further, and ICUs are no fun. Chris's father Aaron agreed that I should stay home with our son until he was one, considering the circumstances. In May 2013, I felt comfortable enough to leave my son with a babysitter, so I went job hunting and ended up being hired on the spot as a waitress at a small but very popular chain restaurant in my little town. Let's just say that this little diner is widely known for their waffles, and we'll leave it at that. Then I was hired to work the second shift, which was the newbie shift because it's not as busy. And after two months, I had worked my way up to first shift. By the summer of 2014, I had long built a clientele of regular customers that enjoyed my service and tipped me well. Enough for me to have a little put back in savings, actually. And it came in handy when Aaron and I broke up. It wasn't amicable at first, and I ended up moving out of our apartment with our son Chris, renting a small two-bedroom trailer in the same town. Fast forward to mid-November of 2014, when I first met Ryan. It was an abnormally slow Saturday morning shift at the diner, when two men, one late forties, early fifties, and the other maybe early twenties, walked into the diner together and sat down in my section. They were my only customers at the time, so when the older man of the two started making small talk, I had the time. The older man introduced himself to me as Ryan, and the younger man with him was his son. Right away by his body language and tone, I could tell Ryan was being flirtatious with me. He even cracked a cliché joke, saying, There's no way you work here, because you're too pretty, and you have all your teeth. Honestly, I wasn't very amused with that tired kind of humour. I had heard it a million times, and while Ryan was decent in the looks department, I was a little annoyed with being casually hit on by him. I was 25 years old at the time, and much closer to his son's age, but nevertheless I faked merriment because a happy customer equals better tips. It's just part and parcel of the job, but suffice it to say my fake laughing and smiling paid off, earning me a $10 tip on a $20 ticket. They were only there for 30 minutes too. Not too bad, I thought to myself. The following weekend, Ryan came back to the diner, and this time, and every subsequent time thereafter, he came alone. There was nothing unusual about this interaction from the last, though. I took his order, we chit-chatted when I had time, I kept his coffee refilled and that was it. But apparently he enjoyed his experience because, again, he left me a nice $12 tip on an $8 ticket. Ryan began visiting the diner every weekend from then on up until the end of December, and had started coming two to three times a week. At this point he really started showing an interest in getting to know me, which isn't something unusual per se. 
I had some other regulars that I'd actually developed friendships with, some even getting me Christmas gifts and such. So I did tell him things about myself in casual conversation during his visits. Just normal things that normal people talk about. One of them I eventually told him about was the medical miracle that is my son. I even bragged about the fantastic jobs his doctors did, showing him the before and after photos of his surgeries. And over those past several weeks, Ryan's attitude towards me changed. He was no longer this annoying, flirty, middle-aged guy, but rather a seemingly caring person. Now maybe I was naive, but I genuinely appreciated his kindness, and I didn't interpret it as a romantic gesture at all. Ryan continued coming by on my shifts for breakfast three times a week, and by February 2015 is when the first strange event occurred which was soon followed by a string of more. It was Tuesday afternoon. I had picked Chris up from the babysitter and was heading home from work. Now where I lived was on a small, uphill, dead-end road, and as you pulled onto my road from the main highway, you could easily see my trailer on the right side at the top of the hill. It was positioned perpendicular to the road, and the back side of it is visible as you drive up the road. As I eased my way up the hill, something immediately caught my eye, and that was that I could clearly tell my back door was open. I put the brakes on immediately and tried to figure out what to do, as I literally never touched or unlocked that door, much less opened it, so I knew something was off. A door is not going to unlock and open all by itself. I ended up parking my car off to the side of the road and calling Aaron as at this point we were on good terms and co-parenting our son very well. So Aaron came straight over and checked out my trailer whilst I remained back in my vehicle with Chris, and about five minutes after entering, he called me and told me it was all clear. So I made my way up the hill expecting to have been robbed, but nothing was missing, and there was no damage to the door. So Aaron basically brushed things off saying that I must have forgotten to close the door myself. I knew better. But as there was no sign of a breaking and entering, I just let it go. Then two days later, which was a Thursday, I came home from work and there was the same thing. My back door was wide open. At this point, I know I'm not crazy. I know I had locked that damn door. It didn't have a deadbolt, it just had a lock on the doorknob that you turn. And I'd even tested it out that morning before work to make sure it was locked. So I called Aaron again and stayed parked with Chris on the side of the road whilst he did a quick pass through my trailer. But again there was nothing out of the ordinary except the fact the door was open. A quick inventory showed that nothing was missing. But I was really nervous now, thinking that someone had broken in twice. But Aaron disagreed. He attributed the problem to a faulty doorknob lock, which made absolutely no sense. But he went to Lowe's and purchased a heavy-duty swivel lock to install on the door, that locked from the inside. He wanted to put my mind at ease at least, so whilst he was installing the lock, I combed through my house. I mean, I literally spent hours after Aaron left inspecting every nook and cranny of my trailer. The outlets, my shower head, vents and my pantry door, etc. As I thought that maybe some freak had broken in and planted secret cameras. But I didn't find anything amiss, so begrudgingly I let it go again. Two days after that, a Saturday afternoon, I was off from work and heading uphill on the road towards my driveway. My son was spending the weekend with his dad, so I had the house to myself that evening, and a wave of relief washed over me as I saw that the back door was still closed. Now I don't know why I decided to do this, but something compelled me to actually inspect the door up close. I needed to also make sure it hadn't been tampered with, when to my horror I actually discovered that it had. There were pry marks along the edge of the door jamb. I immediately went inside and unlocked the door so I could open it and inspect further, and the edge of the door was bent to hell. That damage wasn't there two days ago when Aaron had installed the new lock, so I deduced that someone had probably been using the credit card trick or something similar to try to easily break in, as the way it locked was by the knob. But once they'd figured that would no longer work, they tried to pry it open not knowing that there was a new lock on the other side. Thank goodness the new lock held. I called the police and made a report, 
but they basically told me there wasn't much they could do other than document the incident, then told me to call them if anything else happened. Needless to say, that wasn't satisfactory, but I didn't know what else to do. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping at home that night, so I ended up making the hour drive to my parents' house and crashed there. Nothing else happened for a little while, and by March I had been able to put February's events behind me and feel secure in my home again. I was working and going about life as normal, and Ryan had now begun visiting the diner five days a week. Oddly enough, he was there each shift that I worked, and it became a running joke with the other waitresses, with them teasing me about having a stalker. I would soon find out just how true that actually was. Because in April, things got a lot weirder. I came home from work one day to find my grass had been mowed. I usually paid a neighbour to do it for me as I didn't have a lawnmower, but my yard was small and maintaining it was a requirement of my lease agreement. My neighbour didn't charge much to mow it and he needed the extra cash so it was a win-win. But I knew I hadn't asked my neighbour to do it recently, so I thought that the fact that it had was really strange. I asked him if he'd gone ahead and decided to do it anyway, but he said he hadn't. I called my landlord and asked her if she had mowed my grass, as the lease states that if it reaches a certain height, then she would mow it and charge me. But I knew my grass hadn't been high enough to warrant that. It was the only last plausible explanation, though. Of course she said no. I was completely stumped. I then assumed that an anonymous neighbour must have done it out of the goodness of their heart. You know, like a pay-it-forward kind of thing. I mean, what else was I to think? So all throughout April and the beginning of May, my grass was being anonymously mowed once a week. And I know it sounds strange reading it, but at the time I genuinely thought a neighbour was just doing neighbourly things and didn't want to be recognised for it. On May 5th, 2015, Aaron and I decided to take Chris to the zoo, and when we got back late that afternoon, we discovered that my front door had been cracked open. Now my front door did have a deadbolt, but I must have forgotten to lock it. How stupid of me. You can imagine how upset I was due to my back door being tampered with multiple times back in February, but I just didn't understand why this was happening again. Like all the other times, nothing was taken and everything seemed untouched. I was feeling targeted, but I didn't call the police because I felt like technically there was nothing to report. Nothing was stolen or vandalised, it was just an open front door. So I let it go again, though two days later I would discover the depth of what was going on. We're now in May, the 7th to be exact, and the year was 2015. It was one of my rare days off and I was at home relaxing when the diner called me. I answered thinking maybe my boss wanted me to come into work, but it wasn't him, it was my co-worker Celia. She stated that someone named Mary had called the diner asking to speak to me and that she'd asked for me by name. But as I wasn't at work that day, Mary left her phone number and requested that I call her as soon as possible. I thanked Celia for relaying the message and ended the call feeling perplexed. I didn't know who Mary was, but out of curiosity I gave her a call anyway. And she ended up being Ryan's estranged wife. I didn't even know he was married. She informed me that Ryan had had a nervous breakdown whilst they were arguing earlier, and he started raving like a wild man about how Lisa, me, was a better girlfriend than she was a wife, telling her that we were in love, and that he had been taking care of me and my Down Syndrome son for months. And my son doesn't have Down Syndrome. She initially thought that it was all just crazy talk, considering his mental state, but he'd mentioned where I worked and said we were going to get married. He said that I had asked him to adopt my son and that he was going to run away with me in order to get away from her. He even told her he'd started visiting me after following me home one day, and when he'd said that, Mary knew something was very wrong. You see, Ryan had somewhat of a history with mental issues, and Mary was used to him weaponizing things to hurt her feelings during arguments, even if those things were lies. But she said this time was different. She knew he had started frequenting the diner, and red flags went up for her when he admitted to following someone home. So she decided to call the diner to see if anyone by my name worked there, and when Celia confirmed this, 
Mary perceived the possible danger and left me her name and number, requesting a call back. My head was spinning. Whilst things were finally starting to make sense, I was still gobsmacked, as at one point in the conversation, Mary mentioned my grass being mowed. Yes, Ryan even flaunted the yard work he'd done for me to her. It was all very strange and very surreal, as basically Ryan had been obsessing over me for months. He'd become delusional and had created a whole relationship between me and him in his mind. Obviously, he'd been the one that was breaking into my home when I was gone. But why he did it, I still haven't pieced that 100% together. He never took anything, and I imagine he was mowing my grass because that was his little way of taking care of me. Anyway, by the end of the call I decided to go to the police department in person to file a report about Ryan. I thought at the very least that this was harassment, and I needed it to be documented. Maybe I could get a restraining order. Mary offered to provide an official statement to the police too, which I thanked her for. So they took our statements, and the harassment complaint was filed. But although I couldn't get a PO based off my statement alone, I had no hard proof. The officer did assure me that he would personally go talk to Ryan. I then went straight to the diner to inform my boss Chase of the situation, and he took it all very seriously. Just that morning, a third shift waitress actually brought up to Chase how a man had come into the diner really early at around 4am, and he was trying to get her to tell him which days I'd be working that week. She told Chase it made her uncomfortable, so when I told Chase about Ryan, he went back and looked at the cameras from that morning. And sure enough, the man that was bothering third shift for info about me was him. Chase initiated the process through corporate to get a permanent ban on Ryan from the diner, which was thankfully approved at a later date. I was scheduled to work the following day, and I was feeling nervous throughout the entire shift. But thankfully Ryan didn't show up, nor did he show up the following day, or the next after that. All was quiet at home as well as I assumed the officer that had showed up at Ryan's house to speak with him must have spooked him enough for him to back off. Weeks and months went by, and no Ryan in sight. There was no vandalism at home, and no mysteriously mown grass either. Nothing. My life had gone completely back to normal. That is, until October that year. October 5th, 2015, and it was around 8pm. My son Chris fell asleep on the couch whilst watching a movie, and I had dozed off as well, until I heard a few very light knocks at my front door. I got up and walked to the kitchen to look out the only window that faces my driveway, and there were no cars except my own, so I figured the light tapping I heard was either the TV or just my half-asleep brain playing tricks on me. So I returned to the couch and started playing a game on my phone, when about five minutes later I heard a few light knocks on my door again. This time I was wide awake, so I knew my brain wasn't playing tricks, so I walked back over to my kitchen window to double check the driveway to see who was there, and again my car was the only one there. Suddenly, just as I went to close the kitchen window blinds, loud knocking erupted up my front door, and I mean loud, very angry banging. My instincts kicked in and I sprinted to the couch, scooped Chris up into my arms and ran down the hallway to his bedroom, then did the only thing I could think of in that fraction of a moment. He was groggy and confused, but he listened to my instructions. Get under your bed, stay under there, and don't come out until I tell you. I then ran to my kitchen and grabbed a knife as I dialed 911. I actually screamed at the door that I was calling the cops, in hopes that it would scare them away. Then I positioned myself at the end of the hallway, which connects my son's room to the living room. This way I'd have a clear view of both the front door in front of me, and my son's bedroom doorway behind me. As the operator picked up my call, the banging was getting even louder and the dispatcher said that the police were on their way. She instructed me to stay on the line until they'd arrived, and about 12 minutes into the call the banging got even more violent, rattling pictures off of the wall. I thought for sure that they would break my door down at any moment. 911 asked me where I was located in the home and I told her, so she asked me if I could hide somewhere. She told me not to put myself in danger, but in that tiny moment I felt enraged Hell no, I'm not going to hide. 
I'm not taking my eyes off my son's bedroom under any circumstance. Where are the cops? Besides, I lived in a small trailer and the only hiding place for an adult is my bedroom closet, so I'd be easily found. I just erupted over the phone. Look, lady, I'm a single mom. I have no man, no gun and no place to hide. If he breaks this door down, what am I supposed to do? Throw this knife at him? Where are the cops? She assured me again that the cops were on their way and to stay on the line as there was more banging, but this time it had moved to the actual side of the trailer. It sounded like they were taking a baseball bat and beating against the wall. Chris began shrieking then, so I ran the few steps over into his room to check on him, and the loud commotion had just pushed his fear gauge over the edge. He was screaming and crying incessantly under his bed, so I quickly ascertained that he was physically okay and returned back to the end of the hallway to check on the front door. But as I was explaining to 911 that my son was okay just scared, I noticed that the banging had suddenly stopped. I waited another minute or so, trying to listen out for any sign of further escalation, like a window breaking. But all I could hear were sobs coming from my son's room. All in all, it took the cops 23 minutes to arrive, but by then the perp was long gone. Now for reference, I live about 10 minutes away from the police station, and the dispatcher had even called it in as an active home invasion. I was livid about the response time. Now my front door was made out of some type of metal, just a cheap generic trailer door, but it was now covered in dents and there were noticeable scratch marks on the lock, which were failed attempts at picking the deadbolt. The siding of the trailer was damaged where the perp had hit it with something, and given his history, I immediately deduced Ryan to be the guy that had caused all this damage. The police said since I didn't actually see the person, then they couldn't arrest him without any eyewitness. The most they could do was make a report. They did end up canvassing the immediate area in case he was on foot, since I hadn't seen a vehicle in my driveway prior to this happening. However, there was no sign of him or anyone. I assumed that he'd probably parked nearby out of sight, and my home was situated next to a thin patch of woods that has public access roads on the other side. I'm also absolutely convinced that Ryan had nefarious plans for me that evening but once he discovered my son was at home with me, via his terrified shrieking, he bailed and gave up. For whatever reason, Ryan always lit up when I talked about my son, and he would always initiate conversations about him, just to watch me dote over him. Looking back, I guess it was his morbid way of bonding with my child, and I think in his own warped way he grew to care about him. So when he heard Chris scream, he decided to not follow through with whatever his plan was for me. I ended up taking a few days off of work because I was so shaken up, and I went to stay at my parents' house because I was so afraid to go home. My landlord had the damaged door replaced while I was gone, but realising I had a job and a life, and that I couldn't stay gone forever, I knew that I had to go home. So I got myself a gun for protection, a small calibre revolver, but it would do the job. Then I went home. I lived in that trailer for another four months before I'd saved up enough money to move, and it was totally peaceful during those months, with no further events or altercations. I just couldn't stand being there anymore. I've also changed jobs since then, met someone special, gotten engaged, bought a house, and got a dog, and there has been no further sign of Ryan anywhere. It's been nearly seven years since Ryan was in my life, and he just seems to have disappeared in the same manner that he'd first appeared out of nowhere. I couldn't be happier that he's gone. Hopefully it stays that way. Now this only happened a few hours ago so I'm a bit shaken up, but it's too early in the morning to phone and wake up my friends and I needed to talk to someone and get this out. I'm so creeped out and concerned. I'm a woman in my thirties and caring for my elderly parents, so I'm staying in a downstairs room in my childhood home at the moment. The window to this room faces the main street, which is a fairly quiet area, and my bed faces the window. I often leave the window open at night as I need it to be cool when I fall asleep, and I haven't really had to worry about it. There's a cabinet with an aquarium in front of the window area, 
not blocking it from view so I can still reach to open and close it, but it would certainly make it difficult for someone to climb in. My dog Sable also always sleeps in the room with me, and while she's a sweet-natured, medium-sized dog who doesn't look the least bit threatening, she's a fantastic guard dog in that she's always alert to any noises, and will stand her ground, bark and growl if she senses a threat, so I've never really worried about the open window. However, after tonight, I won't be able to do it again. It started around 3.30, 4am, and I was awake. As I care for my parents, I often have disrupted sleep patterns, and I'm awake at odd hours, so I was reading a book and heard Sable do a low and deep growl. She then jumped off the bed and began pacing a bit, looking up at the window, before jumping up at the cabinet and barking. I shouted out, Hey, we're calling the police and my dog will bite just in case there was someone there. Then I went to look out of the curtains from the side, and I didn't see anything, so I pulled the curtains closed again, and made sure to pull the right curtain over, then draw the left, the one that covers the open part of the window, all the way over, covering the right side curtain and tucking it down so any wind wouldn't be able to move it. I wasn't really alarmed as such, because as I said, it's a fairly quiet residential area, but there are foxes around that we sometimes hear, and occasionally passing by the neighbour's gate door will make Sable growl or bark. But the way she reacted was very unusual. She'll usually growl but stay on the bed. I thought that even if it was someone scoping out the open window to potentially burgle, they'd seen now that the room was occupied by a person and dog, so would go find an easier target. I mainly guessed it was just a random noise she'd heard outside. But I was wrong. It was a good half hour or more later after I'd relaxed and thought I might doze off that I heard her growl again. It was a really serious, deep, low growl, and I listened, again thinking it might be foxes or something similar. But I heard what sounded like deep, horror movie breathing, like the heavy breathing a pervert makes down the phone to his stalking victim in a film. I sat up, looked up at the window, and my heart stopped. The curtain had been pulled back and lifted at the bottom, like someone had been peeking under it, and I could still hear the heavy breathing. I shouted again, hey, and moved from the bed to the side of the window so I could see past the curtain. I saw the figure of a man move away from the window to the right and towards the front door and the exit of the front garden. It was too dark to make out any features or clothing, but what I could see, it was just a dark male figure. Shaking, I immediately thought that since I knew he'd moved away and wasn't at or under the window, I reached and pulled it shut, grabbed my phone and called the emergency services. In hindsight, there's one thing that creeps me out, and that is that it would have taken a few seconds for me to move from the bed to the side of the window, and that was after I'd shouted and knew he'd been seen. But he must have stayed there even knowing I'd seen him, until I moved the curtain and could look out. Then he moved away. The heavy breathing also had to be deliberate, as it was so loud, like someone trying to frighten me on purpose. While on the phone with police, I went around the ground floor of the house, turning lights on, making sure the rest of the house was still secure. And it was. I was very careful to lock doors and all the other windows at night, and everything looked undisturbed. Then two patrol officers turned up shortly before 5am, and made a report of the incident. They suggested asking the neighbours if they had camera footage and to let them know of a potential prowler in the, in the area tomorrow. Then they drove around the area, saying that they'd been wanting to know what someone was doing, wandering around at 5am anyway. Since the dark meant I only saw the shape of a person, and I could get no real description, I doubt they can do much about it. I couldn't even be 100% certain it was a man, but the breathing and the figure I saw instantly made me think male as the outline of his head looked smooth, so either bald or wearing a tight cap, and height would have been an average at 5'8", five, 5'10". Five, I'm still shaken up, but feeling angry and violated, and wishing we had a camera system now. We'll be looking into getting one for sure. I never thought anything like this would happen to me. I don't have any enemies, no recent exes, no one I know of harbouring any grudges, and since I'm caring for my folks full time now, I'm not out socialising to make any enemies. 
nor are my elderly and disabled parents. I'm at the wrong side of 35, living in jeans or joggers and t-shirts, and I wear no makeup or fuss with my hair most of the time, so not a likely target for a peeping Tom pervert either. If it wasn't for the fact that it was my dog who alerted me to something on both occasions, I'd wonder whether I was half asleep and dreamed it, or imagined it. I have had hallucinations as the result of a bad reaction to an antidepressant in the past, but that was more than a decade ago. It hasn't happened before or since. I've learned from a psychologist how to test my reality in times I was worried about it, and when I asked how I could ever trust my own senses again after the reaction to the meds, they said that to be sure something was real is to see if other people can see or hear the thing too, or if it's a noise or voice outside. I can see someone or something that explains the noise. If so, it's not likely to be a hallucination if both oral and visual perceptions match up. The dog sent someone there first, and I heard and then saw someone, so I wasn't dreaming or imagining it. I don't use drugs and almost never drink. I'm scientifically minded and don't believe in ghosts. And while I love a good horror film, I'm rarely freaked out by them anymore, as I'm too old and cynical. I have to think it was someone who was looking to burgle a house. But then they came back so much later, so maybe it was someone on drugs or having a mental episode. Or, and this one bothers me most, it was someone who just wanted to scare me. But why? Who? They obviously know where we live, so are they going to come back? New fears keep popping into my mind. Like most nights I'm up at some point, or in the very early hours, and will let the dog outside into the back garden for a quick pee. And I'm suddenly aware of how easy it would be to attack and gain entry then. There's a passage around the side of the house to go from the front to the back garden, with only a small side gate, which is meant to keep the dog confined, not designed to keep others out. It would be easy for someone to access than hide against the back of the house completely out of view. They were even bold enough to come back a second time, knowing a person and a dog were in the room. Perhaps they were hoping I would have fallen asleep by then. They seemed to be trying to deliberately scare me when they'd returned a second time, deeply breathing the way they were, and stayed by the window even after I'd shouted. In those few seconds it would have taken from me shouting to where I'd reached the window and looked out through the curtains. He could have been long gone, but he wasn't. He stayed there so I would notice him, only then moving away. That breathing and the cold that ran through me when I saw him will haunt me forever, along with the question of their motives. So I got a new job, and at this job there was a guy who used to watch me whenever he was around. We didn't work together generally, but sometimes we would as we worked in the same department. It was rare though. The weird stuff started a few months after I'd begun working there, and when I had moved within walking distance of my workplace. One October night I was walking home, when a tall man wearing a hoodie suddenly came out of some bushes as I was walking by them. I found this bizarre, so before I entered my apartment, I looked back and saw him standing by some trees and he was watching me. When he'd realised I'd seen him, he jumped behind the trees to hide. I told my boyfriend about the guy and what had happened, and he suggested it was a drug dealer. But whoever he was, I started walking through a different trail. A month later I saw him again, and this time he was crouching by a trailer in a parking lot. He got up and started walking away from me, but still kept watching me as he did so. After a week he showed up again, but this time I was halfway home and he came out of hiding behind the trailer and started walking towards me. I beelined for my apartment's door and ran inside, but this time he knew which apartment I lived in. Previous times I would walk around the front door so that he wouldn't know, as he seemed like he was trying to figure it out so he could attack me. However, it doesn't end there. I got laid off and got a new job, and after three weeks of working there, one day I was getting on the bus, when this guy who looked similar to the guy in the parking lot was watching me get on. 
I quickly hurried to the back of the bus, and when we got to my stop, he pulled the string off. He pulled the string and got off. I got off as well and decided to wait for this guy to keep walking on, but unfortunately he slowed down, seemingly waiting for me to pass him. I ended up walking behind him until we got to some lights, but then he wouldn't move, so I decided to walk on quickly and hide just in case he was looking for my new job's location. During the time I worked there, I saw my ex-co-worker on the train when I was heading back from my interview. He saw me going in the same direction as him and started running, but he ran pretty slowly, like he had a limp or something. It was kind of strange. I also saw him hanging out at the mall when I was there with my mum, but this doesn't really matter as it's a popular place. I unfortunately got laid off from this job as well due to Covid, and I had a month where I just didn't go outside very much. After that I got a new job within walking distance and after one week I was leaving work when there was a guy watching me again. He looked similar to the guy from before, so I ran away. For a month and a bit I didn't see anyone, and one night when it was relatively warm, I was closing close to midnight and walking home, when I saw a white car parked behind a store, seemingly trying to be out of view of any security cameras. I was suspicious of it as it had its headlights off, and it looked like someone was sitting inside. As I walked by, I kept looking over my shoulder until I decided it was probably safe. But not a second later, I got this feeling I should look behind me, and when I did I could see my ex-co-worker walking towards me. I ran as fast as I could and the adrenaline helped me immensely. I didn't look back until I'd cleared some space between us, then luckily I could see there were some men waiting for the bus at the end of the road. I wasn't too worried he'd come running after me, as I've seen him running and he was quite slow. A month went by and I didn't see him, so I assumed he was on vacation. But he showed up approximately a month after that, and one night in early May, I was walking over to a grocery store to do some shopping as it was only 9pm. As I was walking though, some guy who was wearing a hoodie came up from behind me and started walking towards the bus terminal. I guessed he must have overheard my conversation with my boyfriend about going to the store. He was wearing the same clothes as the guy I'd seen earlier, and he was watching me and trying to get closer to me. I asked my boyfriend to get me an Uber, and while I waited I hid by some bags of fertilizer, but I could see he was looking for me. I'd stared at him to let him know I was onto him, and he stared back with soulless eyes. Luckily though, just then my Uber showed up and I jumped in. And I'm not sure if this guy has anything to do with my ex-co-worker, or if he was a random psycho, but I do know that it made me more aware of my surroundings. After that evening I was extremely paranoid and always on the lookout for creeps. I made my boyfriend meet me after work if it was dark out, and a few days later, after nothing weird had happened. My boyfriend met with me just as I saw some car with its headlights on parked in front of a store we had to pass. As we began our walk home, the car slowly drove away, seemingly watching us as it went. When we came to some lights, I noticed the same car, now in another plaza, driving slowly and watching us. Freaked out, I told my boyfriend and he began to get scared. I assumed it was my ex-co-worker as the car this time looked like his mum's. I'd seen his mum come to pick him up at work once. The next night we also saw some man standing next to a black van and the passenger door was wide open. When we passed him he started to follow us, so we started to run. Then ten minutes later I saw some guy wearing a hoodie hiding behind a building with his back against the wall. Now I don't know if the two last incidents are related, but it sure did terrify me and my boyfriend. Mind you, I used to walk home by myself without incident, so I'm assuming that once it was warm out, whoever had been watching me was planning something horrible. After all this weirdness, I changed my hours at work, even though my managers gave me a hard time about it. And despite all the insane crap I was seeing at night, I got my managers to give me rides home, or I'd get Ubers, any time I had to close. But I never walked again at midnight or after 10pm, even with my boyfriend. 
I ended up seeing my co-worker's car multiple times in May when my managers drove me home, and eventually I stopped seeing his car at all, as I think he'd realised I would never be out again at midnight. I'm doing only morning shifts now, so I don't know if I'm still being stalked or not. Last month the sun was starting to set around nine-ish, and I was walking by myself to the grocery store when I saw my ex-co-worker drive past me. I ignored him as I've seen him in this area and is probably unrelated, but thirty minutes later, as I was walking back with my boyfriend, I saw the guy who had been watching me, and he was in the parking lot. He was back and lurking around. However, he saw my boyfriend with me, so started walking away, keeping an eye on us until we got to our apartment. Unfortunately, due to having in-person classes at my university, I'm back to working until 10pm but I have my boyfriend meet me any time I do. I'm worried it's all going to start back up again, and I'm genuinely scared to be honest, as this has been going on for almost a year. I, a female and 24 years old, was 21 at the time, and I lived in one of the largest small cities in the Midwest. I had no car, but a bicycle, and hardly enough money for the public buses, and I worked at a retail battery lighting and repair store doing full-time hours. I lived a little over a mile from my job, and since I was a female in a male-dominated field, I was often a target of abuse. Men thought that they knew better and many times I stood my ground by flaunting my knowledge in subjects that these men couldn't grasp. Because of my willingness to learn, and my close proximity to work, I often worked all sorts of hours, and mostly by myself. At this time I wasn't the person closing, and had a co-worker, a 22-year-old male called Joey, who came in for a part-time shift after he'd wrapped up classes at the local college. We had a close friendship and we often stood up for each other by standing in for the other if we ever got flustered or needed to go to the bathroom in the back. One day Joey received a phone call for a possible repair on a smartphone, and he wasn't 100% sure if it was a phone that we could repair, so he asked the young female caller to stop by for a consultation. She had quickly agreed and said that she would stop by at around 5.30pm, but this was a night that I was supposed to be done by 6, so I could catch the 6.12 bus. It was a windy, drizzly, early fall night, and I remember this because I had my bike with me, and it became my anchor that night. A little before 6pm, this frantic, terrified, bawling 19-20 to 20 year old something came into our tiny shop, and I was at the counter switching out ageing price tags and doing general store maintenance. I looked up at her confused and willing to help, and she looked me deeply in the eyes, asking if Joey was here. At the time he was in our tiny bathroom in the back, so I had to step in and help out any customers, so I told her that he was currently busy and that I was willing to help her. She handed me her smashed, cheap phone very timidly, and my customer service skills couldn't prepare me for what she was going to say next. She quietly told me that her boyfriend, who was out in his red mini truck in the small front parking lot, had gotten angry and smashed her phone when she tried to call her sister that afternoon. I took the backing off of the phone and tried to research the model for any possible screen repair, but there were no results found, so I tried to hand her back the destroyed phone, and she pushed it back in my hands with a pleading look. Then the honking started. There was this light drizzle outside, so our front glass door was covered in beaded drops and was slightly fogged over, so I couldn't see who was making all that noise. I told her again that I couldn't help and for her to try our cell phone repair competitor down the road. The tears started to really flow down her cheeks, and I was freaking out at this point. She kept throwing glances behind her, and the honking wouldn't stop. I shook with fear and rage at this point, as I myself was in an abusive relationship at the time, and knew what this girl was experiencing, so I broke my locked stair with her, and tried to look in our system at a second time for a replacement screen, but again there was nothing. I looked up from our computer and saw a young, shadowy figure of a man pacing in front of the store, but I was just happy the honking had stopped, though I was increasingly getting nervous. 
My whole body shook with fear, and I whispered across the counter, asking if she needed me to call 911. She slammed her hands down on the counter and said that I couldn't do that, even begged me not to. Joey then came out from the back and asked me what all the honking was. As we had a lot of elderly farmers, lazy and disabled customers, that would honk their horns for us to pick up heavy battery cores from their cars, so we thought it was one of those situations. But from what he could see from the looks on our faces, he knew something horrifying was happening. The young guy stopped pacing outside and began banging on our front door. So Joey took the girl's phone from my hands and said for me to go in the back and lock the back employee-only doors. I did what I was told and grabbed my bag, my bike and my jacket. Then I looked at the clock in the back and it read 6.14. I'd spent 15 minutes with this girl, both of us feeling like trapped animals. Now Joey did bodybuilding during his free time and was a gentle unconfrontational, short but stocky guy. I was a short, obese, kind lady that would respond in either of two ways, like a doormat or ready to stand my ground. I knew that I couldn't fight a customer, and neither could Joey, not because of physical reasons. We'd lose our jobs, so we had no idea what we should do. The young guy threw the door open and he had this manic, hateful look about him like a predator. He was slim but muscular, in his early to mid-twenties, and was soaked by the rain. He took the broken phone off the counter and grabbed the girl in tow, hurling insults at us as he went. I gave the girl a pitying look, and he slammed the door shut behind him. Both Jerry and I stood in absolute silence. Then snapping out of it, Jerry ran to the front door and locked it. I told him to call our manager and stood around whilst he did. At that point I noticed that the guy had moved his truck directly in front of our door and was watching us behind the counter as we were on the phone with our manager. I had to leave soon, and the last possible bus came at 6.42. I couldn't pedal my way home in the weather or under all of the circumstances that had just occurred. The time was around 6.18 now, and I just needed to cross the busy highway and down the sidewalk by an eighth of a mile to the nearest bus stop. Joey, the guy and I played the waiting game and it was now 6.23, when the dickhead finally left our parking lot. I told Joey that I would leave at 6.25, so I could arrive at the stop safely. So Joey opened the front door, and I threw myself on my bike and pedalled harder than I could ever imagine possible. Now mind you, our store is in an industrial shopping area, at the very edge of town, and we work next to a sub shop across from a strip mall that has a bullseye store, a local chain grocery store, other retail stores and a bank, all in that large lot. It then began to pour down, and as I tried to pull out of the parking lot, straddling my bicycle, I caught a glimpse of the red truck looping around the sub shop. The highway had dual lanes each way, and I had to play real-life Frogger if I wanted to make it to my destination in one piece. There were a few cars that slowed for me as I hauled ass to the other side of the road. Then I jumped off my bike and threw it on top of the curb. I promptly hopped back on and tried to pedal off, but my front wheel was stuck in the grassy strip, and my right foot had slipped off the pedal. My shin struck the pedal, and I had to act quickly, so I grabbed the frame of my bike and jogged awkwardly to the bus stop. The red truck then pulled into the bank parking lot, of which I had just passed, then he pulled around and went out through the entrance across from the sub shop, taking the closest lane to me. He went at a crawl and turned at the red light so he could circle the main parking lot of the shopping centre. There were three ways to get into that parking lot, one to the left, one in the centre slightly off to the right across of the sub shop, and the other was far to the right next to the grocery store. I stuck to the sidewalk since I felt safer, and was in front of people, and the truck was patrolling the parking lot, the hunter stalking its prey. I felt cold, sore, and cornered just like an injured animal, but there were a couple of cars that had pulled into the left entrance of the lot, which caused the truck to stop from re-entering the lot again. I almost collapsed in the crappy small bus stop, when I felt my phone buzzing. I saw that it was Jerry, so I propped my bike against myself to answer it, and he told me that he had been watching what was going on with me, and even though he had an elderly couple in the store that he was helping, He wasn't going to allow the guy to hurt me. I started to cry. All of this had just gotten too much. 
The red truck looped around once again, and again, and I saw the bus pull up early at 6.39. I couldn't be happier. I knew the driver too as I used the buses to get around town, but I had my stupid bike to worry about. So I hung up with Joey and put my phone in my jacket. Then I strapped down my bike in the rack that was in front of the bus, and I struggled with it because I was shaking, and it was slick from the rain. But I finally got on the bus and turned to the open bus doors. I could see that the truck took a left at the centre entrance of the lot, so I could finally let my guard down, and I sat at the front of the bus with my hands shaking, trying to get $1.25 for the fare. The driver said that it was okay and that I could take my time. So I kept my backpack on, pulled my damp phone from my pocket and dialed Joey's number to let him know that I was fine. In under 15 minutes I made it to my apartment safely, but I was deeply disturbed. I took my bike in so it wouldn't draw any attention to where I lived. Then I had an epiphany. All of what happened made me decide to leave my own domestic abuse situation a few months later when COVID took the world by storm. To this day I wonder about that girl, and hope that somebody more daring and stronger than me called the cops on her abuser. That she had the strength to leave that violent man, for her to write her own story and to recover from it all. I'm currently doing significantly better in life, and finally have my own car. I live a couple of states away safely from my past life. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed my video. And if you did, could you please give me virtual hugs by subscribing and clicking that notifications button. I also have a Patreon page and YouTube channel membership if you'd like to support me further. Thank you again for being here. Keep being creepy.